I've been drinking coffee for many, many years and trying different types of coffee. I would say, you know, one in sometime in February or March, we was like many families sitting around the dinner table, thinking about uh, talking about COVID, talking about its implications and, and what's been going on. My oldest son, Ravi, and I were, were discussing coffee and how, how, how much we love coffee. And he said, you know, what, what if we learn to roast coffee and sort of looked at each other and said, that could be interesting. What does that even entail? Uh, so we both went our separate ways and did a bunch of research and came back a couple of days later and were going back and forth on a roaster that we thought we should buy. And um, he, I, had, I had my pick. He convinced me to get the other one, which I'm glad we did. Um, and then, you know, I had no idea, where do you buy green beans and all of the stuff? And so I would say this journey since February till today has taught us a lot about uh, green coffee and sourcing coffee and roasting coffee and different brewing methods. Um, so, you know, we'll spend the next, whatever it is, 80, 90 minutes talking about uh, coffee, how wait, 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 wait starts off how you roast it, what we should be paying attention to when you're roasting. Um, and then towards the end, the fun stuff, right? Maybe talk about uh, a couple of brewing techniques that doesn't require you to have a, a barista degree or training. Um, and you can make delicious coffee at home um, very easily without fancy machines. And if you want to do fancy machines, that's great, but you don't have to. So, I thought that would be sort of a good good journey that we can go on. Um, and anything you would like to add to that, Clayton? No, I think this is going to be uh, just a lot of fun. I know you and I have had a lot of great conversations as you've been going along this uh, this road, learning about coffee. So I'm really excited that we can share it with everybody. And um, if folks have any questions about any of this, they should definitely just uh, to just chime in and let us know. But uh, yeah, I'm excited. Let's jump in. Right. Well, you know, I think it's important to show people a coffee plant and how coffee actually grows. It's a, it's a berry. Uh, it's a fruit. And it um, grows best at higher altitudes. Um, there's actually a coffee growing belt um, that's sort of around the equator around the world. And, you know, uh, the closer you are to it, um, then the higher you are, the, that's, that's, that's a lot of the coffee producing countries. Um, but that's what a coffee plant looks like. That's what the berry looks like uh, when it's first picked. Um, and it is a fruit. And so what you see is, you know, the, 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 the coffee, the, the cherry itself on the top, um, the pulp gets removed uh, at the farms, um, sort of deep pulping. Um, and you can see there's sort of a wet, uh, what's called the wet parchment um, around it after the pulp is removed. Because those are the two seeds that you find inside of the cherry. Uh, once the pulp is removed and, and the, the mucilage is removed, um, you get you know this third photograph at the bottom. Um, what's called parchment and, and what the parchment is sort of very, very thin, another thin layer. Um, once that is removed, you get the, you get the green bean uh, itself. And it's that green bean that's extremely hard um, that what gets transported, roasted, ground, brewed, and that's what we enjoy as coffee. Um, the bean itself, uh, the green bean itself, is usually has different densities, and the density is all dependent on the altitude at which the coffee was grown at. The higher the altitude, the denser the bean, the denser the bean, the harder the bean. And so you do get um, different certifications of coffee that are strictly hard bean, strictly high grown. And those got those as lots of different classifications along with, you know, organic and fair trade and all of that. But um, when, when you start looking into roasting coffee, you want to start paying attention to the density of the bean, how it's grown, where it's grown. 
um, and how it's processed. Um, so the process that you're seeing here in front of you would be a sort of generic process, uh, what they call a washed process. And so sometimes you will see people talk about a washed process. Um, uh, those of you that like Ethiopian coffees will know that um, many, not all, but many Ethiopian coffees are naturally processed. And that, what that means is that the, the fruit, um, after some of the pulp has been removed, that just gets dried um, naturally. And so if you think about it, some of the sugars actually are then embedded in the green bean itself. Uh, it's a separate roasting process, you know, the way you should, you have to know whether your beans are, are washed or natural, and there's an in-between process called honey. Uh, but you, how your coffee bean is actually processed will determine how you roast. Um, but the natural process has more of the sugars in it from the fruit. It's sort of uh, infused much more into the green bean, and it provides more of a fruity um, sweetness to the bean itself. So, you know, when people talk about Ethiopian fruit bombs, that's what they're sort of referring to around the green bean itself. Um, so there are different ways that green beans themselves are also processed. Um, and, and there are multiple different um, variations on that that I myself am still learning about. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're thinking about it, you, there's the washed process, there's the honey process, which, which is in between, and the natural process. And the, the reason I'm telling you about the natural process is because that will tell you why some coffees taste sweeter than, than, than other coffees. Um, so, so that's something um, you, you definitely want to, want to be paying attention to. Um, yeah, I have a question, Hitan. Yeah. So I know that, you know, you, you had some pea berry uh, coffee recently. Yeah. And that last picture, I know that there's some, there's some anatomical differences between pea berry beans and other coffee beans. Maybe you could explain that for folks who've seen pea berry or, you know, are just curious about that. Yes. So we offer a pea berry, a Tanzanian pea berry. And the pea berry uh, happens to in it, it happens to be coming out in about five to ten percent of the uh, of the fruit, and the pea berry is actually where you see the fruit having two beans. The pea berry just has not split, so it's just one bean, and it's a rounder bean and a smaller bean, but it doesn't have the two sides to it. Um, we we tend to roast it the same way as we would everything else, but. Um, we do find that it's a special taste, and um, we we just offered it because we thought it was kind of fun. Um, but it's probably our one of our best selling beans, the the pea berry, and people really really love the pea berry for everyday drinks, for espressos, for um, and a bunch of people recently have told us they've been using it for um, cold brew. So the pea berry is a really it's. it's Technically, a deformity of the bean, but it's a single bean rather than two beans from the same fruit. And one other question that uh, I've had: I've seen on some coffees they advertise 100% arabica, um, which mean I mean I assume that means that there's other types of. Do, do, is that a species of coffee? What, is, what, is, what, what does that marketing mean? Yeah, so there are two basic types of coffee, right? There's arabica and there's robusta. And Robusta is a, um, it grows at lower altitudes. It's a cheaper coffee. It's not as, um, uh, it's not as sought after as Arabica, right? And so Arabica is sort of the, 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 the main, what we know as coffee. Um, within Arabica, there are different varieties that you get. Um, and depending on, you know, which, um, uh, cultivars farms have done or there's been cross-pollination um, uh, that that's that's within the arabica family now some people or at least some of the italian coffee that you get or italian espressos that you get um, i'm told have a little bit of robusta in there because the robusta is what helps create a lot of the crema and so what's happening what i'm seeing these days with lots of specialty coffees um, where there's a tendency to only go with Arabica and not mix it with any Robusta, 
is uh, people will pride themselves in saying, you know, we've roasted this bean and it's going to give you a really good crema um, in your espresso. Uh, so, so that's usually sometimes people will throw Robusta in a blend. Um, it wouldn't surprise me that, you know, depending on the quality of the coffee you purchase, it may have a percentage of Robusta in them, but it is cheaper. Um, and it's considered at least among people who consider themselves to be coffee snobs to be of an inferior quality to Arabic. Still, I would assume it's preferable to chicory um, for a coffee snob, which has also been used to extend, but I know, I mean, I think actually in South Africa, maybe people even drink more, more chicory and then think of chicory as coffee. That's right, and you get a blend, and in India too, you get a chicory coffee blend um, that gets sold and, you know, you, it's, uh, once again, I think all of this is a matter of taste. Um, what you, what you like and how you like it, it's just with roast levels. There isn't a, a right or wrong roast level. It's what you end up enjoying and what you end up liking. Um, so I, I was gonna show a couple of green beans here. Um, we have some green coffee, right? Um, these are green coffee beans. They have a very distinct smell. I wish you could smell it. It's kind of a grassy, hay, hay-like smell. Um, and they're, and they're surprisingly small. Um, they're very, very hard. Um, and, you know, if I put some roasted coffee next to it, you'll see the size difference, right? And, and that's what the roasting does. Um, not only does roasting take the moisture out, but it also increases the size. So that's, that's green beans there. That's green coffee beans. Um, and that's what we use um, that, that goes into our roaster. This is our roaster. This is the second roaster we've got. Um, and this is a slightly bigger one. It's called the Bullet. Um, you know, the, the roasting process is actually, it's not very long. Um, a roast will take us some, anywhere between 9 to 14 minutes, depending on your roast level. Um, the very important thing about roasting is that you've got to charge or preheat your roaster um, for a good 40 minutes so that your first batch is, is fairly good. Back-to-back -back roasts are not, not a problem. Um, because once the beans go in, you want the beans to be charged at a pretty good temperature. And so a lot of roasters talk about the charge temperature. So at, that's the temperature at which I'm setting the roaster at even before I start roasting. And when I have my charge temperature, there's this little cute top up here and a, um, a funnel that goes. And once I pour the beans on the top there, uh, the beans go into the sort of roasting drum and that's when the roasting begins. Um, and you want to monitor the roast very carefully because it goes through a series of stages and there is, there is a tiny little window here you can do that from. And most roasters also have, you know, uh, a, a pullout that you can sort of take out and, and, and examine your roast and um, see where it is at, in, in the stage. And I'll talk to you about the process, the, the various roasting stages. Uh, but while I have you at the roaster, once the roast is complete, we, we, we lift this this lid up, the drum, and since the roast, the drum is still rotating, everything goes into this tray. And this is the cooling tray. Um, and like everything else, you want to get the beans cooled down to room temperature as quickly as possible to stop the continuation of the cooking. Um, so there's a little fan back there and it cools the tray out. Um, in the meantime, the roaster We'll, we'll, we'll keep the preheating so we can get the next roast going. Um, so, you know, it's not um, very complicated on that front, but it is, um, it is something that you want to be paying close attention to because you're dealing with very high temperatures, right? You're dealing with temperatures that are um, going up to you know, 435, 440 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, when you decide to what you call drop the beans, 
um, is, is when you have your roast level. Um, and so that your, there's a temperature guide that tells you that. So that's a little bit about what our roaster looks like. And, and I just explained a bunch of, you know, what the, what the process looks like. But I think it's important for you to sort of get a sense of what the various um, stages of roasting look like. So when you add your beans, um, they're green and they're, you know, what, what, what looks, what's no, numbered one here on the top left. And they go through a process. Um, in the first three minutes, they go through, uh, go through a yellowing phase and it's called yellowing phase. You see these green beans start turning yellow. Shortly after that, um, there's this very interesting wet grass, um, hay, uh, bush felt slash wet dog smell that we call that you, you start smelling. And what, what's really happening is that the, these beans have moisture collected in them. And so that moisture is actually what's evaporating and you're getting this sort of wet smell. Um, and from the yellowing phase, that's sort of the first piece that you're paying attention to, and you want to sort of mark where yellowing happens. Um, once yellowing happens, you know, sort of around here, um, and you start getting into sort of, you know, 9, 10, 11 here, um, it's where the, the Maillard connection, uh, reaction starts happening. And this is, you know, what, what people will be familiar with, um, Let's see, you know, when you see uh, marshmallows that you're roasting as they start getting brown, um, when you're baking bread or you're baking cookies or biscuits, the sort of browning that takes place, it's where that reaction starts taking place. If you're frying dumplings, um, that browning process. So the same, exact same thing happens with coffee. And so you see the browning process happening. And one of the things that every roaster has to pay very close attention to is with all the moisture that's now um, in the bean that wants to escape, the, 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 the cellular structure of the bean starts changing. And that moisture wants to escape because it's expanding. And so what actually happens is you hear what's called your first crack. It's, it's the sound of... Um, What's a good way to explain it? It's like listening to popcorn popping, but much lighter. And when you hear first crack, um, it's an important note. You, it's something you want to be noting when first crack happens based on your temperature. And first crack depends on how, much, how many beans you have in your roaster, on what your charge temperature is, and the type of bean. So... Um, some beans get to first crack much quicker than others. Uh, but the thing that we aim for is that if we're roasting the Congo and we tend to get first crack at eight minutes and 30 seconds, we keep, you know, if first crack happens way sooner than that or way later than that, um, something went wrong. And I want to sort of get to know what wrong, went wrong. And, and by way too late, you know, I think... 30 seconds, 40 seconds this way or that way doesn't really matter that much. Um, the one thing we've learned is that in coffee roasting, um, one minute, two minute, three minute increments actually changes a lot. Um, and, and especially after first crack. Because after first crack, it, it's, that's where the, your, your, your judgment as a roaster comes in. Um, you know, how long after first crack are you going to drop the beans? Some people drop it at about 30 seconds, and so you get what's called a very cinnamon roast, a very light roast. Um, as you start getting deeper and deeper into after first crack, it's where your roast level starts increasing. And in fact, as you're pushing a very dark roast, you get a second crack, which is the buildup of carbon dioxide in the bean that's now being released. The second crack is much, much softer. It's almost like um, crackling gra uh, glass or something like that. It's, it's, it, if you're not paying attention, you'll miss second crack. And um, we usually, if we're going with a dark roast, if we've hit, as soon as we hit second crack, we tend to drop the beans. Um, uh, because it's, it's, you, beyond that, once you start getting 
you know, too quickly after second crack, you're starting to get um, burnt coffee, coffee that just doesn't taste very well. It just, just, just doesn't taste good at all. Um, here's, a, here's a graph, right, that, that, that sort of shows you what I was just talking about. Um, you know, you get the green unroasted, you're starting to get yellow and pale. And this graph is also graphing a little bit of the temperature as the temperature of the bean itself is increasing. Um, you can see there, first crack is underway. And interestingly enough, as a roaster, we, while we offer and we talk to people about, do you like a light, medium, dark roast? Um, when we're actually roasting, we don't use that terminology. Um, what we actually talk about is, is it a city roast? Is it a city plus? Is it full city? Is it full city plus? Or are we getting into the full French roast? Um, and so when Ravi and I are talking, we'll talk about, are we dropping this at a full city? City plus, where, where are you at? Because um, even, even with people who've told me that they like medium roast, um, some of my medium roasts have been too dark for some people and for some people they've been too light. So there's, there's such a spectrum even within medium roast. So I like to sort of really go with, you know, is it a city, city plus, full city, full city plus. Uh, once you're starting to get full city plus, that's where your sort of second crack is really happening in that area. Um, and the interesting thing about roasting coffee is in the early stage is where um, you get you, the, the flavor of the coffee bean, you're really keeping it. Um, you, you get much more acidity in the lighter roasts, but you're actually tasting the, the characteristic of that bean much, much more. Um, as you start getting into the medium roast, you're balancing the acidity with more of the sweetness because the sugars are now sort of caramelizing a little bit. So you get more of the sort of balanced body, more sweetness in the coffee. Once you start getting into the dark roasts, um, a lot of people sort of say you've burnt all the flavor of the coffee out. The, the, the characteristic of that particular coffee at that point is gone. And what you're tasting is more the sort of bitter, bittersweet roast um, of, the car, of, of the roaster rather than the characteristic of the bean. Um, so I will say that, you know, I... For years, we drank a certain, you know, major variety, um, dark, dark roast. It was a French roast, and we swore only by French roast. And since we started roasting coffee and started roasting coffee at different uh, stages, my palate has changed. Um, I've, I'm appreciating lighter and medium roasts in ways that I never thought I would appreciate I'm able to taste the nuances of certain coffees uh, much better. There's a Costa Rican coffee, an organic Costa Rican coffee that we offer, um, which I absolutely love in the light to medium roast. And I actually drink my coffee with milk. Uh, that's a coffee I drink black. Um, I really appreciate what comes out and the flavors that come out. So as you sort of roast, you're also, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> changing the taste profile of the coffee bean itself. And a lot of people do argue that as you get into the dark roast, you really are, um, quote unquote, ruining the coffee bean itself. And that to stay on the lighter medium side, you, you're able to keep the characteristic of the coffee um, or that specific farm or that micro lot. Um, and that is why I think we've tended to really go with coffees that um, Region specific, country specific, region specific, and even farm specific in some cases. And, and in many cases, in fact, in all cases, we try to be purchase organic um, and fair trade um, where, where possible. So, so, so this, you know, this graph, I think, hopefully starts telling you a little bit about what the coffee bean is doing as it's being hit with, um, uh, with, with heat. Um, and, it, and it goes quickly. Uh, you can go from a full city to burning your coffee in 90 seconds if you're not careful. And so you have to be very, very careful 
as, as you're sort of um, um, roasting. Now, once, you know, I was also under the impression that, well, once you've roasted your coffee, you grind it and you drink it. And I've learned that that's actually not the case. So what we do is we roast the coffee and we let the coffee degas um, for three days. And we either, we leave them open for, you know, the first couple of hours, we put them in mason jars or in some container. And twice or three times a day, we open the lid to let the carbon dioxide that the beans are releasing, uh, we let that escape. And what we found is the coffee tastes so much better three days after it has been roasted. Um, and for people who enjoy espressos, uh, we recommend actually seven days after roasting is really prime um, for, for really getting the sort of peak flavor. Now, there's nothing wrong with roasting, grinding, and brewing a cup of coffee. There, absolutely. It's, it's, it'll, it'll taste great. There's nothing quite like it. But the flavor profile changes significantly um, as you let the carbon dioxide from the bean release. Um, and, you know, we've, I grew up in an era where a, a really dark, oily, shiny bean was what um, you should be drinking. And um, what I'm learning is that if my beans are too oily right up front, I've over-roasted them. Um, and, and I don't quite like it as much. Now, freshly roasted coffee after a week, 10 days, two weeks, sitting out in an open jar or with sunlight, you are going to see the oils slowly start coming up. That's just natural. It's a natural process. And, and that's okay. But if my beans come out of, out of the roaster very oily, I, as far as I'm concerned, I've over-roasted the, the coffee bean. So I'll, I'll pause there for a second, Clayton, in case you have any questions just about the roasting process. Well, I can certainly ask lots of questions. And if other folks have questions, they, they should certainly chime in across uh, any of the chat streams. Um, one question I had. So you said at the very beginning, you have your charge temperature. Um, do you usually go for a constant temperature while you're roasting or are there fluctuations? I know if I'm roasting a marshmallow, like there's all sorts of different techniques about, you know, do I hold it far away? Do I stick it into the coals? Do I want to catch it on fire right away and then pull it back so I get more, you know, the gooey stuff inside, but that shard outside. Uh, is, is that part of the, this kind of the art of roasting of fluctuating your temperature? So it's not so much fluctuating your temperature. You want to keep the bean temperature slowly increasing uh, because as the bean is absorbing heat, um, the bean itself is heating up. Now, what happens at first crack is there's an exothermic reaction. So it's giving off heat. And so the beans actually heat up even more. So what you really want to try to do is as you, as you get it close to first crack, you actually want to pull back on your temperature. So you pull back either on your heat. In our case, we have uh, three controls. We've got the heat control. We have a fan control. So you, how, how fast the air is blowing through the drum. And we also have a drum speed control. And that is the, the, speed, you know, the speed at which the drum is rotating. Now, we don't mess around with uh, drum speed that much. Um, we tend to set drum speed fairly constantly depending on how much the volume of coffee. And part of why that's important is you don't want the beans sitting too long and being exposed to the drum for too long because then you're actually going to get scorching and the bean will scorch. So you want that centrifugal force working for you. Um, as, as we come close to first crack, we actually pull back on heat. And in some cases, we increase the fan. And that's because you don't want a spike in your bean temperature after that exothermic reaction takes place. Now, between first crack and you dropping is what often people call the development phase. It's where you want the coffee flavors to really develop. And if you hit it with too much heat, you get to second crack really quickly. And I think you kill a lot of the flavor. And so what we try to do right after first crack and dropping the bean is we really 
pulling back and playing with both temperature and the fan speed to prolong um, the time that we get to second crack um, without dropping, making the bean temperature drop too much. Because if you do that, then you actually get a baked bean. You don't get a roasted bean. Your bean actually ends up being baked. And, and we're in Boston, so that's a bad thing, though. That's a bad thing, okay. exactly. Um, you can taste a baked bean. You, the minute you, you, you grind it and you, you have that first cup, you, something's just off because you know um, it doesn't taste like coffee. And so you have to be careful about not pulling the heat back so much that you actually bake the bean because you want the bean to roast. So it, at this point, and this is why I think I really love roasting coffee because if this is where it starts becoming a combination of both an art and a science. Um, and, and this is where you start having fun. Um, you know, do how, how much heat do you pull back? How much fan do you put in? And, and fan is also interesting because with, um, at some point, if you have a lot of heat and you increase your fan speed, that air is also heating up. So the warm air, as, as you get higher up in the fan speeds, ends up also helping with the roasting process. So you, want, you need to monitor all these things at the same time. And it's a lot of trial and error, a lot of trial and error. And I look back at some of our roasting logs from when we started, and I can't believe that's what we did with our beans. Um, but we keep meticulous roasting logs of every single roast, every single roast that we, have, that we put out as a code, um, and I can go back and say, oh, this is how we roasted that bean. And the person said it tasted this way. I wonder why. Um, so you can troubleshoot to some extent and you can tweak the, your, your recipe, so to speak. We have a question from the chat, which is wondering if you know much about the history of coffee, how plants originated and when, you know, how long have people even been drinking coffee? This is obviously pretty complex to figure out the, this interplay, but it is something that you can do with, you know, I'm sure people were doing it in a, you know, on a, on a, in a pan over a fire, probably once upon a time. Have you looked much of the history? Do you know much of that? I, I know some of it, um, you know, coffee originates from Ethiopia. And, and if you go to, um, I haven't been, but uh, uh, my partner Jenny has been to Ethiopia where they, she's been in at these coffee ceremonies and coffee is actually quite sacred and used in lots of different ceremonies. Um, they still roast coffee over a fire and, you know, uh, uh, they grind it and you serve coffee and it's actually a whole ritual around coffee. So it originates in Ethiopia. Um, Obviously, there's different cultivars, and that's changed a lot. And I, you know, so I, I, I've tried to read up on on a lot of the history of it. Um, and you know, like every other crop, and and I won't hide this fact, right? Like every other crop, or what you want to call it, a cash crop, it's it's a dirty industry. Um, it's where people have historically been exploited. Um, and continue to be exploited. Yes, we now have fair trade and people trying to really implement new measures and making sure farmers um, get paid um, fairly and workers get paid fairly and organic certification, et cetera, et cetera. But um, there's a whole dirty underworld side to coffee. Um, and, you know, we try to read up on, on our origins and where we, we source our coffees from as, as much and as, as best as we can. Um, but it's tricky. It's tricky to, to get all of it. And so I try to read much about it, but, you know, I can't say I know that much about, you know, all of its background. I wonder if it started in Ethiopia, but it has spread across so many parts of the equatorial world. Um, maybe this would be, I, you know, we, I see advertised shade grown coffee, um, and, and different kind of varieties that, I mean, are they all from an original African bean that has then just been adapted for all these different climates or did it kind of evolve? I mean, how did it get to Hawaii? Was that just somebody like taking pineapples to Hawaii and said, oh, this is a great place where you know, we can start growing something that's never grown here before, but the growing conditions are ripe or did it kind of evolve in different places? Is uh, I, I don't know. Do you know much about like how did it kind of that history of the spread across the world? I wonder. There, there's yeah, probably I mean, a book about that. So, well, well, the spread of coffee 
you can also tra trace it. You know, if you look at um, how coffee got to Mexico or to parts of Latin America, it, it, it came and it followed the same trajectory that colonialism followed, right? So colonists sort of brought it with them. And, you know, probably that's where different cultivars came about and that's where how it started growing. Um, you know, places like Hawaii are interesting because it's not so much the altitude, but the volcanic soil that actually helps it grow. So there are certain places where there's good volcanic soil where coffee does grow. But um, I would say that as coffee spread, and if you look and if you overlay that map with the map of colonialism, I think you're going to see quite a, quite a nice overlay. Interesting. And I'm sure there's uh, several theses that could be written about the comparison of that spread versus tea, which obviously we know had such a, you know, tea was part of the American Revolution, was part of, you know, the, the British Tea Company uh, going to India. And, and so much of the reason, I think, for that trade was to get to tea, which is another story altogether. Yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I don't know if there's a, an opportune time to talk about some of those distinct flavor characteristics from around the world. And if we want to spend a little bit of time now before we start, because I think the next step in the program, we're going to start talking about we've roasted the beans, we've let them degas. It's time to start figuring out how we're going to grind them and start thinking about brewing them. But maybe before we're ready to do that, we should talk about the different flavors that are out there, because yeah. not just hazelnut and French vanilla. Yes, that's right. And, and I will admit that I did go through my flavored coffee phase, um, which I'm embarrassed to admit, but I did. Um, and I think everyone does. Um, but I think, you know, I think flavors and characteristics of coffee, at least for me, fall into three very sort of general categories, right? So um, lots of African beans are what I would call fruity. They're, they're bold coffee. They're quite fruity. Um, beans that come from Indonesia, right? So people, and, and they all have different names, right? There's Java and Sumatra, and there's a bunch of, you know, different subcategories there. Those beans and those coffees, the ones I've roasted, have very um, earthy, very earthy characteristics, uh, you know, someone who wants a good earthy, you know, sort of dirty cup of coffee um, should, should, should try one of those. Um, the Central American ones are the ones that I would call more flowery, fragrant in, you know, um, the Costa Rican coffees come to mind, um, Guatemalan, Guatemalan coffees come to mind. Um, how did Colombian coffees get so popular as we're going through Central America? I think it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great coffee region, right? So in terms of growing, it, it's, got, um, it's got incredible climate for, for coffee. Um, as you start getting away from that band, you get Brazil and then you get Mexico. <coughs> and, you know, Brazil um, is so huge. It's, it's, it's one of the largest producers of coffee. It ends up setting the price for coffee. Um, from what I learned is that, you know, Brazil produces everything from really cheap coffee to very high quality coffee. A lot of their cheaper coffees, I think, are what gets used in blends. Uh, when you see blends, um, it's usually made up of a large chunk of Brazilian coffee that, you know, you can roast and then you can add 20% of a really nice coffee and 30% uh, of a medium quality coffee. And you have a coffee blend and that you can market nicely and sell for a lot of money. Um, so you have, you know, Brazilian coffees to get used as a base. Um, but because Brazil and the is so large and the altitudes change so much, it's so varied. You get all kinds of coffee flavors and profiles out of Brazil. Um, but you know, Mexican coffees, for example, um, we've, we roast three different Mexican coffees and they all for me have a sort of very chocolatey characteristic. They, they all taste um, kind of in the, in the medium range for me, uh, chocolatey, um, a good everyday cup, um, and, you know, and, and it's interesting, we're talking about Mexican coffees today's Mexican National Day. Um, and and we're, we're, we're very proud to um, 
uh, roast three different Mexican coffees. And, and, and we like doing it partly because, you know, Mexico used to have a coffee industry after the earthquakes in the 80s. The coffee industry, they got completely decimated and the government stopped supporting coffee farmers. Um, and now what's happening, I would say the last 15, 20 years, maybe a little longer, uh, lots of cooperatives have come up. Um, and, you know, the, the regions of, you know, uh, Veracruz, Chiapas, uh, Oaxaca, produce some fantastic coffees. And they've, uh, Mexico has also had a long tradition of producing organic coffees, um, hadn't introduced chemicals. So uh, a lot of the coffees there, are, you know, fair trade, are organic. Um, I really like roasting the Mexican coffees. They're, they're not very dense. Um, they roast quickly. Um, they tend, you don't want to over roast them, but you know, anywhere from the light medium to the slightly darker end, they can hold it anyway in that range. And people tend to like them. Um, it's a great, great everyday coffee drinker for, for us. Um, we, we like it a lot. Um, you know, I mentioned the Ethiopians, very sort of fruity, you know, the fruit bomb. Um, there's an Ethiopian yoga chef that I've been roasting recently that I really love. It's a, it's washed and not natural. I think I shared some with you, Clayton, um, which, which we really liked. Um, and, and we started even roasting a decaf. I haven't drunk decaf coffee in about 25 years because I never had a decaf coffee that I liked. They all tasted very chemically to me, but we have a, a organic Honduran coffee that uh, that's a decaf that we've been roasting. That's absolutely delicious. And um, let's talk about that for a minute. So the first, like I know uh, the first time I think I remember, I, I really thought about drinking Mexican coffee was in Mexico in a, a small village where they were serving it. It was just like, it was either you had water or you had coffee and they were serving it at all times of day. And they kind of, they swore, I don't know if it was caffeinated or not. They were serving it to everybody, little kids and everything because it was, it was out of the water. Um, but then, and, and they, I think they, they thought it was decaf. I don't know what kind of process they used, but I wonder, so what is the technique? How do, how do decaf beans actually, how does that work? I know you and I've talked about it a little bit, but let, let's share that with everybody else and, and your yeah. understanding of, because so, I know there's two different processes at least. Yeah, there are two different processes that I know of uh, that are current. You know, I think historically there used to be a chemical process. And the two predominant processes that I'm aware of is uh, a mountain water process and a Swiss water process. And these are both um, natural and, and they're both... Uh, a sort of washing technique. So these the, the green beans actually sit in vats of water. And my understanding is the caffeine kind of leaches out of these beans over a period of time. Um, and the beans actually dry out much differently. So a decaf green bean is actually not very green at all. Um, it's, it's significantly browner. Um, and the moisture content is kind of all over the place because it's kind of soaked in water and then dried again. Um, and I, I know there's some process that takes place where people have said, well, if it's been soaking in water for so long, does it not also lose some of the coffee flavor? Um, and then there's some way that I think it gets re-soaked in it to, to absorb some of that back. Um, but that is also why decaf coffee is more expensive. Um, even when we buy decaf green coffee, it's much more expensive than just getting straight up green coffee. Um, and so I, I now know why decaf coffee, even when you buy it off the shelf, is much more expensive. Um, but it's a process that I've, I've, I've paid some attention to. I've tried to understand it a little bit, but uh, it's not something, you know, I don't understand the complete ins and outs and, and the chemistry of it. Um, but, you know, every time we've tried a decaf coffee or tried roasting one, we've made sure that um, we've pretty much stuck with the mountain water process um, as, as, a, as a way of decaffeinating coffees. One other question that I had was you were talking about blends and you know you mentioned the brazilian way of blending or the, the the common way of taking a bunch of cheap beans but then you know to to have the body and then flavoring it with something else on top um 
I, you know, I think you and I were talking the other day about taking different roasts and taking a bean and, and playing with a blend between having, you know, let's highlight, let's get a little bit of that super dark so you can have that, that kind of that, that, that deep flavor, but then taking some beans roasted at a different, you know, pulled earlier so that they have more expressive qualities of the bean itself. Um, I don't know if there's any examples of that happening or if that's something you've played with, but I thought that was kind of a fascinating idea and, and I just want to yeah, find it. Yeah, we, you know, so, so as you know, we've stayed away from blends. Um, it's, a, it's a crowded market. It's not something I want to sort of get too involved in. Um, but, you know, if you're a coffee roaster, you end up having bits of coffee left over. So inevitably, we're drinking blends here at home. And we're always saying, no, let's try 25% of the Tanzanian with, you know, 50% of the Congo bean and uh, some Mexican, see what comes up. Um, almost every blend we've tried, we've liked. Um, but um, but what, what I haven't really seen out there, and maybe it exists, but I've tried looking for it, is, you know, people will, sell, will, will advertise a blend. But what I haven't seen is a blend of what, what you and I talked about is, you know, maybe taking the Costa Rican bean and, and roasting it light and roasting it sort of medium dark and finding some percentage of that blend that's actually going to taste different. Um, and so, so that's one I really want to play around with. Um, we started doing that with our Congo bean, which is a, a delicious, delicious bean that we love on the darker side of roasting. But someone last week ordered it as a light roast, which I've never, I've never roasted it lightly. So I roasted some extra. And so it's just degassed and, and uh, uh, this is ready for, to try this week. So I'm, I'm very intrigued to try some, um, Congo, Kivu um, as a light roast. Um, you know, the other thing about roasts is you go out there and you buy roasts and people will say, I like an espresso roast um, or I buy an espresso bean. Um, there's no such thing as an espresso bean. An espresso bean doesn't exist. Espresso is a brewing technique. And so there is no espresso bean. And I would argue there's no such thing as an espresso roast either, because depending on how you like your espresso, I know someone who drinks espressos with a very light roast. And so you could do an espresso with a light, medium, very dark bean, all of that's in your control. So um, first of all, I think we have to demystify the fact that there's no espresso bean, but there's also no such thing as an espresso roast. Um, and that is why um, one of the major chains have what's called a blonde espresso. It's an espresso with a light bean. Um, but we're, somehow we've been um, socialized to think that an espresso roast or an espresso bean is something on the dark side. And that's not actually true. I remember having a conversation with a barista once who had a really fine espresso. And uh, I was asking how did they, you know, what was their secret? And they were telling me in Italian that it was a mix of, you know, it, it was what you were describing earlier. It was probably a little bit of the Robusta for crema, um, but then they had, I think it was Colombian and uh, maybe it was Rwandan. I forget what the other bean was, but it was this mix um, to get that perfect espresso. And that was like the, the consummate espresso. It was more about the body and, and the crema um, than it was about a roasting technique or anything else. So That's right. And, you know, and some people like the espresso that's... Um, that's, that has that, that acidic kick to it, right? And you're going to get that acidic kick if your roast is on the lighter side. And, and because the darker you roast, you're roasting away some of the acidity. And you're bringing forward sugars. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's talk about some brewing techniques. Um, when I think about espresso, I also think about Cuban coffee, which, because like Oriental that I know used to live, ne you live, live near, I always love getting a nice espresso to end my meal from Oriental because they've got a nice machine and they just make a really nice espresso there. Um, I don't know how they do it. I don't know if you've even analyzed or had it, one of those since you've been going on this brewing adventure. Um, but yeah, let, let's let's explore, and I know you have some some things to show us in this department too. So I'm not trying to tell you which way to go. I'm just yeah. Let, let's talk about brewing. 
You, you know, interestingly, you mentioned um, Oriental. Um, every time I've asked the owner what his secret is, he tells me it's his milk. He says he buys the freshest milk from the, 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 the local farmers, and that's his secret. So I think he, never, he doesn't want to give me a secret. And Nobel is not telling the truth because I drink it black, and there's something about his black espresso that is still very fine. Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. And, I, and I, you know, I think when it comes to espressos, straight up espressos, it's ultimately the machine that you have and the temperature at which that water comes out and the pressure at which it comes out. And look, there are lots of things on the market that try to mimic an espresso in a manual way. And we can talk about some of this. And it's what it does. It mimics it. It doesn't, it's not a real espresso. It may come close, but you know, you're not going to replicate an espresso machine. You, it, you've got a certain temperature in a certain time frame at a certain pressure extracting um, you cannot replicate that. Uh, you can come close, but otherwise that's difficult. So your machine is where that comes in and um, how, you know, it's not just your machine, right? It's also your weight um, and, and, and how clean your machine is. And one of the things we have learning really, really quickly, not just when it comes to your brewing equipment, but your roasting it, um, is, is coffee, the oils of the coffee, the dust from the coffee, gets everywhere and and you've got to constantly be keeping your equipment very very clean um the roasting process just you know you've the oils that come out from there just leach into the the different filters and you you have no idea where it comes from uh, but to keep your equipment clean i think is is very 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 important in producing a very good cup of coffee that's always tough because some of my favorite pans are those cast iron skillets that like you don't want to clean it too much because it's that history of having, you know, all that good food that gives it the seasoning. So, but yeah. I agree. I think cleanliness, especially to have it represent the beans in front of you instead of your history of beans, that, that sounds really essential. You were saying before, and I think it was a helpful framework that there are four things you can control in coffee. So maybe we can boil things down to those four things. You, you mentioned seasoning though, you know, roasters need to get seasoned. And so, you know, so, so do, you know, those little uh, stove tops. They need to mm. get seasoned. So okay. I'm not suggesting you scrape the, everything out of it, but okay. you, you want the seasoning to take place. So, okay. Important yeah. balance. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so I would say when it comes to brewing, and, you know, if you go online and start looking at brewing techniques, I mean, it gets horribly confusing. Um, and, and people start, I think, overthinking it. But I think there are four things that are really important and four things that are in your control so that you can drink a really good cup of coffee. Um, the one is temperature, the temperature of your water. Um, you know, it's easy to figure out what your temperature of your water is. And then with some practice, you know that, okay, after it's boiled, I open the lid. 30 seconds later, it's roughly where I want it to be. So temperature of water is very important. Um, the weight of your coffee is extremely important. I never used to weigh my coffee. And now we've got two digital scales. Um, I weigh my coffee every morning um, because your proportions are important. Um, and if you're trying to tweak, that's something you know, do I want to add more coffee or less coffee? So the weight of your coffee is important. Coffee scales these days are not expensive. I think it's worth the investment. Absolutely worth the investment. They don't even take up a lot of space. You know, one of our one of one of them. I mean, it's tiny, right? It's small. You can. You, it's it's worth definitely worth doing. And so you should definitely go by weight, not volume. Everything that you see about copy preparation says use two tablespoons per eight ounces. I think is the the kind of the rule of thumb. I go I go straight by weight. Everything goes by weight. Um, and then the other is grind. How you grind your coffee. I mean, you know. So we we have a we have a, a burr grinder. Um, uh, you know, they're not cheap. Um, I mean, you can start spending thousands, thousands of dollars on a, gr on a grinder, but you don't need to. But for about $100, you can get a very good quality burr grinder, ceramic burr grinder. Uh, and grind size, depending on how you're brewing and your brewing technique is really, really important. Um, because your extraction, that, that determines your extraction and how your coffee is ultimately going to taste. So grind size is important. And the fourth one that I put in there 
that we've got a lot of control over is time. How long do you let your coffee brew or sit and, and be extracted? And I think those four things, they're all very simple, right? Temperature, weight, grind, and time. They're easily controllable. And you can tweak any one of those for, your, what, your, for what your coffee could and will, will taste like. I will say, and I'll put a plug in for this, there is no substitute for freshly grounded coffee, freshly roasted coffee. That, that, that just isn't. Um, it's, it's, it's completely different. Um, and and when, you, when you have freshly roasted coffee, you grind it fresh just for what you're consuming, you're going to enjoy a delicious cup of coffee regardless. Um, and there is no substitute for freshly roasted coffee. So my plug is um, whoever your local roaster is, support them um, because you, you will see the difference. And don't hoard coffee. It's fresh. Um, you're not hoarding, you know, eight pounds of carrots and putting it in your fridge. You're buying them every week. You know, treat coffee the same way. Um, keep it in an airtight container away from light, uh, away from humidity and you know, it's, it'll, it will keep you going for a week, 10 days. Um, and you will see a decline. It won't be bad, but you'll see a decline in taste and, and, and flavor. <clears throat> so, um, I have some, um, toys here that I can share with you. Uh, and we can go through some of that. And part of what I wanted to do is really walk through some of our brewing techniques because um, Clayton, you and I were talking about this recently. When you're starting to figure out what is it that you want to do with coffee, there's no place you can go to test this. You have to buy it and then decide whether you like it or not. Um, so hopefully we can walk through some of these and if people are not sure about, oh, is this what I like or that's what I like, we can be helpful in some way or not um, without you having to go put out some money uh, and then deciding you don't like that brewing style or that brewing technique or what it's producing. Um, so, you know, we usually start out with Kalan Brews, our coffee, uh, freshly grounded. Um, we use a, um, we use a Baratza, um burr grinder. Um, and, you know, we, we weigh and we only grind what we use. And this particular one has 40 settings. Um, and that's because, you know, we have an AeroPress, we have a Bialetti, and we also have a, a Clever Dripper, which is, uh, I'll talk about. And those all require different grind levels. Um, so, so, you know, getting the right grind level is, is very important. Um, one of the ones my, my son loves is the, and I think Clayton, you love this too, is the AeroPress. I own a couple of those, yep. And, you know, the AeroPress is um, at least marketed, right, um, that it's a way to give you uh, uh, an espresso. Uh, I won't say it gives you an espresso, but, you know, it's one of these that, that mimics one and comes close to giving you a fairly strong coffee, right? It's very simple. It's got a little, you know, filter cap there, a filter, uh, a white fil paper filter goes in there that you, you know, you sort of wet and you put, put that filter there. You grind your coffee, um, you know, you, 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 put, you put your coffee in there, um, you, you pour the water. Um, the one thing I will say that's very important in all of these is you have to let your coffee bloom. And by that, um, add, you know, just enough water to cover the coffee and let it sit for 15 to 30 seconds. And what you'll notice with very fresh coffee is you'll see the coffee bubbling quite a bit. And that's the carbon continuation of the carbon dioxide being released from the freshly roasted coffee. Blooming is very, very important. And I, I highly suggest that for that first, first 15, 20, 30 seconds, let the coffee bloom. And, and that's when you add more water. Uh, and after you've added more water, at least on things like the AeroPress or the French press or anything where the coffee is just sitting there for a while, I highly recommend stirring the coffee. 
because you really want to maximize, you know, you know, it's what, what we call, you know, you know, agitated, but you want to increase the, the extraction. You want all, you don't want the coffee grinds that are at the top not being fully extracted. You're wasting your coffee. So give it a good mix. Um, the AeroPress then, you know, has this top here with the, with the vacuum seal. You know, it, it goes over a cup very nicely. Um, and, you know, you let it sit there for, you know, about a minute and a half, two minutes, depending on what you like. And you sort of very gently push down. And, you know, it fits very nicely over your cup. Um, you don't have to use a lot of force. You just let your hand just sort of sit on it and it goes down. Um, and you get, a, you get a really, really good cup, you know. And what's nice about it is that you pop this open. Um, the, the puck sits there and you just force it out and... You, you wash everything and it, everything's cleaned up very, very quickly. Um, my son loves the AeroPress. Uh, it, you know, it produces roughly one cup. Um, so, so if you're looking for two or three cups in the morning at the same time, that's not, that's not going to happen. Um, the other we have a question as we're going through, and I'm going to interrupt for a second. Um, so there's a question from your cousin about what is the quality of water that you'd recommend? Tap versus filtered versus bottled versus distilled versus boiled three times. You know, how do, the water is obviously important here. The quality of water is very important. And, you know, we're spoiled in Boston, right? Because the quality of our water in Boston is very good. Um, so I use tap water. I don't filter the I don't filter our water or anything like that. But um, I would say if you're living in an area where your water quality is not good, filter your water. It makes a huge, huge, huge difference. And you know, I we used to use a Brita, but uh, I have I have uh, family in Florida that swears by. I think it's um, zero water um, with that filter. Um, filtering your water will undoubtedly make make a difference in the quality of your cup, regardless. Um, I just, you know, we've been lazy, uh, but that's because we have the luxury of being lazy because the quality of our water is so good. But I absolutely agree. Um, the quality of your water is extremely important and, and you should pay attention to that. So if you're paying attention to it for your drinking water, then use it for your coffee as well. Thank you. I should also point before we get too far from AeroPress, if people don't like the idea of doing the paper discs, I recently upgraded and got metal uh, filters, um, which are a little trickier to clean. You have to pull them out before you press out the puck. Um, but I do find that it makes it more similar to the French press because the paper will filter out the oils, whereas the metal lets the oils pass through. Um, and I prefer that. But, uh. And you know, the same concept applies for if you have a pour over. Some people like the paper. Um, uh, filters. Uh, some people think the paper that you get a papery taste. I I usually say that you know just if you wet the paper just a little bit before you put your coffee grounds, that tends to get rid of that cardboard papery taste that people some people get. Um, you can use the mash filters, the the metal mash filters. Um, I find that the metal mash filters um, produces an oilier cup of coffee. And sometimes I'm in the mood for an oilier, kind of dirty cup of coffee. Um, the paper filters, uh, in in because they get they 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 keep more of the oils. You get a you get a crisper cup of coffee. Um, so you know if you're using a metal filter, and the taste is you know too oily for you, it's not as crisp as you want it to be. Switch to a paper filter and see whether that makes a difference or not. Um, the other brewing technique that we love around here and, and um, produces a very strong cup of coffee is the, 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 the Bialetti Kitty. Um, and this is, you know, this is a, a revised version of those old um, aluminum Bialetti stove tops that you see, um, you know, very Italian, right? Very traditionally Italian. The, this is sort of works on the same concept. Um, you have the bottom reservoir that you fill until, you know, the, 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 the valve uh, on the inside. Um, you've got your, you know, your, your holder for your ground coffee. This is where we would grind um, fairly fine, fairly fine coffee. Uh, we don't temp it. Um, we just fill it up to the brim. But once again, we, we do measure. So it's, you know, about 20, 22 grams of coffee. 
um, that goes very nicely in there. You know, you you um, you screw it in fairly fairly tight, um, and then you you know you put it on a on a on a stove top. We have a gas stove and. Um, we tend to put it on very low heat. We don't sort of crank up the heat. And we found that a, a constant low heat um, really produces an extremely strong cup of coffee. Um, what's nice about this is that if you want to drink an entire large mug of really strong coffee, you can. Um, but it produces enough for, you know, two cups if you want, if you're making a latte or a cappuccino. And it's... Uh, for for me, this comes the closest to an espresso or a cappuccino, uh, without getting into the machines. Um, and I and I like just you know watching it on the stove top, and it doesn't take longer than than anything else. It's it feels like a production, but it's not. Um, and I will say that if you end up getting one of these, um, do yourself a favor and also get yourself the replacement gasket and the replacement filter at the same time. Because if it's something you're used to and you like this coffee every morning and that gasket goes one day and you don't have a replacement, you may not want to be waiting the three days before it gets to you. So um, get the replacement. It's, it's worth it. You won't regret it. I think you um, learned that the hard way. What's that? You may have learned that lesson the hard way. That's right. Exactly. Um, How yeah. do you know when it's done brewing when you have it on the stovetop? That's something I've always kind of, I figured it out when I've used those kind of brewing techniques before, but I always have a little bit of apprehension. Like, is all the water out of the bottom? How do you, do you have a secret to? Well, you know, you, once you start, the, when you hear the gurgling, you know you're towards the end. Hmm. Um, and then when you open the top, you just don't see any more coffee coming out. <laughs> okay. Right. And, and, and a lot of people complain that every time they do it and they open the reservoir, there's still a little bit of water left. That's just going to happen. Not all the water is going to be going out. Okay. Um, yes. And there's nothing wrong with your pot. It's just the, the way that this is designed. Um, and, it, and it's totally fine. Okay. Um, Good. But you hear the gurgling towards the end and you know you're coming to the end. And even once you start the gurgling, even if you just switch it off, um, that last minute will just sort of work off the it's, it, the, the residual heat that's already in there. Great, thanks. The other thing we've started playing around with is, you know, um, this is what happens when you have lots of freshly roasted coffee in your house, right? The, um, the, the, the Vietnamese coffee that you get in Vietnamese restaurants, you know, it's a, a very fine, fine grind. Um, it's sort of, uh, you, you open this up, it's got this little metal filter. Um, it's got another filter at the bottom, and then it sits on top of this that has its own little sort of filter. Um, and so you, you, know, you, you put your very fine grounds in there, you let it bloom, you tamp it very gently with this, um, you fill it up with water, you cover it up, and you sort of just put it aside and... Um, you add a little condensed milk to your cup at the bottom, and then you let it sit. And we like to drink it hot, uh, but some people sort of mix all that and pour it over ice, right? So you get the sort of this delicious iced coffee. Um, so th these are these are these are fun, and and they're and they're lovely, and they produce quite a quite a nice coffee. It's just it's different. Um, uh, another similar um, technique. Um, and, and common used in India is, uh, you know, there's a sort of vessel, the stainless steel empty vessel down here. You have the vessel at the top, um, which has these holes at the bottom and a, and a filter. Um, you put your coffee grounds in, in here, um, tamp it, fill it up, um, and then, you know, you can just put, in the, put this in the fridge. You, you tend to do a, a, a coarser ground or, and, and let it sit for longer. Um, it produces what they call a, a decoction. So it's almost, you know, a reduction. Um, it's, it's what cold brew is actually based on. Um, and this can sort of sit in the fridge and you almost get a concentrate that um, you can mix with, with milk and heat it up the next morning um, or add water to it and put ice and you have cold brew and 
you know, this is a different technique than iced coffee, right? Where you take hot iced coffee and pour it, hot coffee, pour it over ice. So you get iced coffee and cold brew, which is you're using room temperature. Uh, I mean, you use hot water, but then it sits at room temperature and you can just put it away. Um, and for what I hear and what I understand from people who drink cold brew and iced coffee, that the cold brew technique produces significantly less acidity. Um, and people find uh, if acidity is a problem for them for drinking coffee, cold brew apparently um, is not as acidic and people seem to like it much better. Um, I, for the longest time, thought cold brew and iced coffee was the same thing until I started looking into it and researching it. Um, and I've learned we don't, we don't do it here. We've experimented with some of our roasts for cold brew because I know people have asked us, but it's not something we, we drink. Um, so so that, that, that's, that's one of them. Um, the final one I have here, um, and it's the, um, it's the Clever Dripper. And, and I really, we've been using this for many, many years. And it's a very interesting concept. So it's shaped like a pour over, right? Looks like just what you pour over and you pour your water. But it's a combination of a pour over and a French press, right? So a French press is where the coffee and the water is sitting and the coffee is being extracted and you filter the grinds out and you pour out your coffee. So this is almost a, a combination. And what makes it a combination, it's got this really clever valve at the bottom here. So when I release it, this valve is closed. And I can, you know, it sits on my countertop. I put the, the, uh, the, the filter, right? So I'll, I'll put in a, I use a paper regular number four milliliter filter. I always recommend folding it at the bottom and on the sides because people tend, when you don't, people complain the seams burst and that's because they, they don't fold the bottoms and the sides. And so you want to fold it so it reinforces the filter. Um, and so, you know, you have that in here and um, I happen to have roasted or uh, ground some flat, freshly roasted coffee earlier. I did wait. And then, you know, you, you have your, and then you pour the water in here. And it sits in here until you are ready to serve. And that's when, when you put it over your cup, the valve at the bottom releases and the coffee drains down. So here you actually have great control over how long you want your coffee and your water to sit and want it extracted. Um, obviously, you don't want to keep it too long because, you know, the, the thinking is if I keep it long enough, I'm going to get a stronger cup of coffee. That's not entirely true. You're going to get a more bitter cup of coffee because you've probably over-extracted your coffee. And so um, you're not necessarily going to get a stronger, more caffeinated cup. Um, the other myth is that dark coffee has more caffeine than light coffee. In fact, lighter roasts have more caffeine than darker roasts. Um, so a dark blend or a dark roast isn't necessarily a stronger cup of coffee. It tastes more burnt or roasted, but it's not necessarily stronger. Um, so what we like about this is, is exactly the, the control that you have over it. Um, and they come in two sizes, and the, the larger one does produce, if you cheat a little bit and add extra coffee and then add a little extra water towards the end, you do get two decent cups of coffee. Um, and, you know, once again, we also, we let this bloom um, for 30 seconds. We add the water. I like to let it all sit for a total of two minutes, two minutes, 30 seconds before I put it on top of my cup. And you get a delicious, delicious, delicious cup of coffee. So that's called a clever dripper. A clever dripper. 
Yeah. And they're, if you get them on Amazon for pretty cheap, it's a, it's a, yeah, they go for anywhere from 15 to $20. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And yeah. you have a couple, so you can make two cups at the same time, I assume. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, I, I'll, I'll show you here. Um, because we have it. We also have a question. Ah, you put some water in. Nice. Yeah, so water is in there and it's blooming. Now, do you agitate it while it's in there as well, like we were talking yeah, about with the other methods? Blooming, I, I tend not to, uh, but if you're doing it in an AeroPress, you should. And so now, you know, it bloomed. And once we've added the extra water, I do give it a stir. Okay. Um, and, and what's a good a clue as to when... Uh, you should stir is a lot of times on the paper filters after you, your, you've had your coffee, you'll see a lot of coffee sitting on the top. That means you haven't, you haven't stir, you haven't given it a good stir. So you're actually wasting coffee. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you give it a good stir. We let that sit for another minute, minute and a half. And, um, you know, we, we can do it right now. So you see it. We can wait. You're going to drink it. It's okay. We have a couple of questions. So if you want to give it another minute or so. Right. Um, so there's a couple of what, the first question is about grind size. Um, you mentioned having, you know, four different grind sizes depending upon uh, the piece. So how, uh, how do you know what the right grind size is? Some of it's going to, well, yeah. How do you know? So <clears throat> almost um, all of your, um, whatever, whatever you buy, to brew will come with a grind size recommendation um, that, you know, uh, if it's cold brew, you rec- you know, people recommend a coarse grind because you're just letting it sit for much longer. Um, if it's the Bialetti, um, it recommends a finer grind. Um, anything that's more like a pour over French press um, is a medium grind. And then, you know, even within medium like that, you'll find, oh, you know, you may want it slightly finer, slightly coarser. Um, but, you know, once again, that's in, some of that is in your control. Um, but whatever you end up buying will give you guidance on it. And then I would suggest you tweak it from there. Sure. So the, the, the follow-up question makes a lot of sense. We said before going into all these gadgets that it would be so great to be able to try a bean across brew these different ways. And most of us can't do that. So you've been asked, which is your favorite and why? If you didn't have, you know, how do we help people choose what's going to be best for them? So my, so that's two part question. My favorite is um, the Congo, the Congo bean, the organic bean from the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's from the Kivu region. Um, it's produced by a, a co-op there. Um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, is, it's interesting. There's a whole sector there of co-ops that are looking at coffee as uh, part of the peace economy as the country sort of comes out of a lot of conflict, um, really using coffee as a way to promote a peace economy. So we, we like the values of the producers, of the people that are importing it. Um, but it's also a delicious coffee. I actually didn't know you could get coffee from the DRC. Um, so for me, and, and in fact, I, I speak for my family, the, the, the DRC Kivu dark roast is our favorite. Um, my, my, I would say close second is, a, uh, is the Costa Rican light roast for me. Uh, and I drink it black because it's, it's very, very flavorful. Um, you know, when people call me and say, you know, what do I get? What do you recommend? I usually start with saying, what, tell me what you like and give me some examples of what you like. And based on that, I, I tend to make recommendations, right? Um, you know, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. There isn't a right or wrong. It's what you like. Um, and then as I get to know people, I also push it, right? So Clayton, you've always told me you just like dark coffee and I've been throwing you some medium roasts, which you've been like, hmm, this is interesting. So um, it's Jackie and I both. We're we're trying to you know satisfy a couple of different palates. So, yeah. Yeah. but I think I think exposing yourself to different roasts is is great, and and I highly highly encourage it. Um, and you know, 
I'll say experiment. Um, try, try things you thought you didn't like. When it comes to freshly roasted coffee, I'm yet to have a bad cup. I can certainly agree with that. Yes, uh, they, there's different flavors. I think um, the question is also with all the gadgets that are available, all the different brewing techniques, you know, so let's say we took that, that DCR, um, DRC, yep, DRC, DRC. Uh, let's take that DRC, the DCR is completely different. That's right. Uh, let, let's take the, the, that Congo, uh, Congolese, the Kipu bean. Um, if you like, do you, do you have like, is it, how do you decide which you have lots to choose from? So how do you choose which to use? And then how would you advise if, if somebody was going to go out, like I actually have a coworker, uh, another librarian at the, um, who was just asking me, she said her French press just broke and was trying to figure out what she should get next. How do you direct people like, you know, who don't want to spend a hunt, you know, tons and tons of money on different devices. Um, you know, where would you go next? What, you know, how do you prioritize which machines to, you know, what, what toys to buy next? Yeah. You know, um, we did a very informal survey of people and I was surprised how many people use French press. Um, French press produces a great cup of coffee. Um, if you have something that you like and works for you, stick to it. Um, if you think, oh, I like French press, but I also like pour over, try something like the Clever Dripper. It's sort of in between. Um, uh, you know, and if, and if you like something, you know, stick to it, but then say, oh, you know, let me try a stovetop. Um, maybe, because everything I've showed you here is all under 50 bucks. Um, and you can do it, you know, we also have a, a little arrow latte thing here that produces a really decent foam and we add that and you have a great cup of coffee. You don't have to go nuts with, with gadgetry. Um, I say keep it simple. The simpler you keep it, um, the more control you have about or around the other variables. Um, and, and, and that's the main thing. Um, so I'll put another plug in for the AeroPress then while we're at, like, I know I've gone backpacking. I've done long, you know, some, some long distance bike rides where the AeroPress, like I could travel with it really well. I actually know like Corey Doctorow is a, is a writer and, and blogger and, and everything, all the you know, internet kind of, you know, wonderkin. Um, and he swears by the AeroPress because you can be in a hotel room. And whereas, you know, you don't know the quality of coffee, it's very easy to, to travel and to just get a hot water and bring your own beans. Maybe you, Maybe you're not roasting them immediately, depending upon your travel circumstances. Um, but you could have a, a fairly frequently, you know, recently uh, um, ground bean, and then add it to your AeroPress. And, and and the cleanup is really what I love about it. That's why I have one at work um, at, at the library, so that I can, uh, you know, just express that pod right into the to the compost into a trash bin, and. Uh, and it's just such a, so easy. Whereas so many of these others, I'm, I'm like messing with grounds. Although that, that easy dripper looks pretty simple to clean up. Yeah. It's very, you know, we travel with one. And so yeah. you have this, you've got your paper filters, you know, it's sitting there like a French press, right? And the minute I put it over there, you saw the coffee just drained. And you know, there's the mm. cup, right? Um, so it filters down, the valve is open and um, the coffee is dripping away. And, you know, there's, there's your cup. And you, you know, heat, heat up some milk and, 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 and froth, froth it up if you need to. And you've got a little cappuccino. Do you heat your milk on the stove? I guess we should talk milk techniques really quick because a lot of baristas, that's the magic is in how they handle the milk. And Nobel at Oriental was saying it's all about his milk. Um, you know, I, I'm going to do a plant-based uh, and probably almond milk, I think, is the favorite in our house, although some folks really like oat as well. Um, do you usually use a, a full-fat milk? What do you like to use? I, I do use full-fat full, full, uh, full, full fat milk uh, if I can. Um, and I'll, I'll just be upfront. I microwave my milk. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, you don't want to you don't want to overboil it or overheat it. You want to heat it just enough so that you're going to get some froth. And I pour that over. And, you know, if you want to do it on a on a stove top in a little pot, that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, I I I'm a big fan of there isn't oh this is the only way you do it, the only way you brew a good cup of coffee. There are multiple ways to get here, um, 
and there are multiple ways that work for people and for your tastes and you should do what works for you, what's expedient, what you can afford and what you enjoy. And that's, that's the bottom line, right? So if someone starts telling me that, you know, I don't know what a good cup of coffee is unless I have a blah, blah, I stop listening. <laughs> no, fair enough. Yeah. Well, this has been a definitely a deep dive. I think we have delivered as promised. Um, I don't know if folks have any other questions. I've been watching the chat streams, but I think we've covered uh, all the questions that have come up. I don't know if you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave us with. You have a hot cup of coffee waiting for you, so I don't want to keep you from it for too much longer. I, but, I do. Uh, I do have a hot cup of decaf coffee, which I know you're not a big fan of. Um, you know, I, 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 I remain open. I, um, I, I, I need to go and, and be bold. You know, I, yeah. I, I've run so many hours that I can drink as, as you know, my wife will tell you, I can have a double espresso and then just go to sleep. Um, like, well, th those of us that aren't as fortunate, um, they have to rely on decaf at night. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, my parting words would be um, support your local roaster. Absolutely. Um, Try, try fresh coffee. Just try freshly roasted coffee. Um, get a scale. Weigh your coffee. Okay. Uh, and, I, and I'll say the four things you can control, right? The temperature of the water, the weight of your coffee, the grind size, and the time of extraction. You have complete control over all of those four things. They don't require a huge investment. And you're going to have delicious coffee every morning or every afternoon or every evening. Um, and be surprised. And, and then I will say, if you think there's only one type or roast that you like, try something different and see whether you'll surprise yourself or not. Those are all words to live by. We, we did have, I, I want to respect, we have one other question that came in here just uh, under the wire, wondering if all decaf is equally decaffeinated. Um, and obviously there's half calf. I know people who do that and I always have to I always look at them askance if it's early on a Sunday morning or if I'm having brunch with somebody and they tell me they're serving me half calf, I tell them to give me a double because I just can't abide. But uh, <laughs> but that that's me. We're not, let, let, let's talk about decaf a little bit longer. So my understanding, and I could be wrong on this again, is um, I think different decafs are decaffeinated at different levels. I don't think 100% of the caffeine is ever taken out, is my understanding. And what I understand as half calf is 50% decaf, 50% caffeinated. Right. And that's how people sort of make their own blends. Which um, I say, just why don't you just add water to your coffee? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do add water to coffee. I know. You just have to have good water. We talked about that. <laughs> so. um, but, but I think um, the question, the person asking the question is correct. I, all decaffeinated coffee is not decaffeinated equally there's not an easy way to like measure how much caffeine is in a cup i know that like with when, with brewing we can do absolute value you know we can look at uh, at density and look at the differences in densities between you know before and after adding sugar and yeast consumption and all that but we don't have a similar chemical process going on here with caffeine how did do you know what the how they actually determine how much caffeine is in a cup this is a level of nerdiness that i could get into but i probably shouldn't okay <laughs> so you do know, but it's late and we should, you should enjoy your cup. Oh. I think what I know is dangerous. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. We'll leave that for future conversation. Absolutely. All right. He 10. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Enjoy your cup of coffee. Thank you everybody for joining us. I uh, hope you all enjoy a deep cup of coffee and let's all celebrate Mexican independence day uh, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Absolutely. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Good night. Night.